Welcome to Rising Tide Startups, where today's most exciting solopreneurs share their startup stories. They also deliver tangible strategies that they would implement personally if starting their business over today. Each episode is a startup masterclass. Make sure you take notes. Take it away, Kevin. This is Kevin Pruitt with another episode of Rising Tide Startups, and my guest today is Mass Fries. Mass, thank you for joining us on Rising Tide. Kevin, thank you so much for having me on. He's calling. Uh, he's he's my, the second uh, person that's connected to Denmark that we've had in three years on the podcast. But actually, he's the real deal. The first one was a transplant to Denmark. So actually, we have the first Dane on Rising Tide Startups. So. Thanks again. And uh, he's actually he's he's transplanted himself to the Dominican Republic right now. So he's enjoying some some fun in the sun and hoping there's no hurricanes coming through that, that part of the world right now. But Mass, share a little bit with our audience about who you are and give some background. Sure. So uh, I grew up in Denmark, but I always loved to travel. Uh, I didn't have the means when I was uh, young, but as soon as I became an adult and had the possibility to travel more, that's been high on my priority. Um, always been interested in human psychology. What is it that drives us? Like, why are some people happy and other people are not? We're living better than kings and queens, right? If you look at it objectively. So I'm super fascinated about what is that that gives us like the spark and the joy. So a uh, quick bio, like I studied psychology and business at, um, at Copenhagen Business School and at Harvard. I have worked as a management consultant. I've started different companies. I'm a partner in something called Kring, where we build different ventures. So we basically a startup factory. And then I run Growth Island, which is a podcast where I interview people on how to be the best version of yourself. And I do workshops on both habits and something called Nordic biohacking. And then I love learning from new people. So we're really excited about being here on the, on the show. And we, we, uh, we love having you. And I mean, the, the biggest risk that a podcaster like myself can take is to invite another podcaster on as a guest, because I mean, I've listened to some of your shows, you do a great job on your podcast. And I there are so many directions that we can head, but let's, let's just really start. Let's go back to say university, you know, when you were finishing your education, and you were kind of thinking, okay, now what's next? Did you did you just step into the business world, step into business consulting? Um, what was that pathway? Yeah. So um, actually, starts as a kid, I was extremely curious. Uh, I drove my parents nuts by taking all the electronics apart and trying to build new things. Uh, I was selling uh, peaches, I think it's called, outside of our house when I was like five years old, yelling at, uh, at people like, "Hey, hey, come buy stuff." <laughs> um, so so that curiosity, like after business school, I was like, "Where can I learn a lot?" Um, and where can I get exposed to many different things? And I have found that management consultant was a place where if you had a short attention span, you would like work three to six months on one project really intensely, kind of like when you were playing a, or like you felt like a team because you were like, you had hard deadlines and so on. And then you could shift on to the new project. And, uh, and that made me really excited to be able to work with smart people and work on different projects. I, I love the way you describe that. I mean, so many people talk about kind of the shiny object syndrome and, and you know, the attention span of maybe a gnat, you know, yes. but I think that's almost a quality that an entrepreneur has to have, you know, that you, you try so many different things and you're interested, in, especially if you're, if you really are focusing on the startup phase of a business. I mean, most of us like to start things, but we don't want to maintain them. We no. want to go on to the next thing. So is that kind of your pathway as well? So, uh, yeah, sadly, I have to say yes. Uh, <laughs> what gives me the most joy is starting new things. That's also why I moved into becoming a partner at a venture studio, where we are building new companies from the ground. Mm -hmm. So I get to be part of coming up with new ideas, testing them out, figuring out what works and what doesn't work, and then find entrepreneurs that become part of these teams and we put investment into it. So that fits my personality extremely well that I can work on creating several new businesses, have the, the fortune of being involved with that with smart people, and then get to the next project a little while after. And that's also what, what Growth Island is like, I get to learn new things all the time because I interview like doctors, uh, scientists, uh, psychologists, different experts on like, what is it that ticks and what makes you happy or what makes you perform really well. So, so yeah, I think it's also learning like what ticks you like as an entrepreneur, <clears throat> many entrepreneurs potentially don't want to be entrepreneurs because there's too much of like the same stuff they have to go again and again, right? But they want to yeah. start new businesses. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I love the way that you kind of describe that. And I'm thinking, you know, that's one of the reasons I probably do the podcast, because I, I'm not good enough to start things on my own. So I have to live vicariously through all my guests. But walk us through the the idea. I mean, I had a uh, I had a guest earlier, I'm guessing, you know, three or four months ago that worked for, um, I think, an organization called Nordic Innovation. And it really is kind of the Nordic countries. And they're they're trying to, you know, work with startups that are maybe in the sustainable space or in the tech space or education space or whatever. Are you focused on specific, uh, I guess, technologies or specific uh, verticals in, in this, this uh, kind of startup yes. factory you create? You talk so, about? Uh, so can we only build companies within health and well-being or okay. energy, where we look at yeah. sustainable energy. So basically, like we believe the best way to create the future is to co-create it or predict the future and make sure it's a place that we want to be. And one of my big passions is uh, health and well-being. So that's kind of the my biggest focus, even though energy is amazing as well, because like both how do we make sure we have a world that's worth being in and we're happy and how do we ensure that the world is still there for us, that we don't mess it up too much. So, uh, so that's the focus. And um, it's the same when I do talks and so on. I do the podcast is very focused on the health and well-being. Yeah, I saw so, that. Like, what is it that, similar if you're a business owner, like what is it that makes you be able to go through the stress of being a business owner? How do you implement the habits so you don't burn out? How do you implement the habits so that you have that extra energy? So when you have to hire someone or you have to lead your team, you show up in a way that makes them feel inspired and be part of your company. When, I, when I've looked at the like the health and well-being space, I mean, it's such a huge space and so broad. And it seems like there's almost two different sections. There's there's one section that's kind of this consistent, backed by science, tried and true, doesn't change. You know, people are just kind of doing incremental improvements in that area. Then there's others. It's like it's the new flashy thing. It's the it's the latest, greatest keto plant-based vegan you know whatever that that atkins you know whatever that that the thing of the year is that you know people are trying so how do you kind of navigate that in that space between something that's just kind of new and unproven and kind of catchy versus something that really does have you know a science support behind it so we look very much at like again like what is the science behind it we looked in something called neurofeedback which is in Germany, is pretty well accepted as a lot of studies, but but it is a hard balance. Um, one of the things that I look out into is what we call Nordic biohacking, which we mm-hmm. call is the the art and science of optimizing your health, performance, and well being through nature and technology. And and we talk about the spectrum that you're talking about as well. You have like double blinded studies, the gold standard of like Western science, yeah. and then you had like my grandma said, um, and and like that's a that's a wide spectrum, they're not the right? same thing they're not the same thing <laughs> so so looking at what kind of evidence do we see but then also looking at um 20 years ago we thought that brain could not change after you became an adult we took that as a scientific fact uh, in the western world it was being laughed at these eastern people that thought that you could change your brain after you became an adult and meditation was the dumbest thing ever like people must have been smoking something wrong right Mm. But now we know 20 years after that the brain does change, that that paradigm that we thought that we had like really Western science, that was wrong. And this more ancestral wisdom, which has been meditated, uh, people have been meditating for thousands of years. There's actually something about it. And we're starting to see more and more of the like ancestral wisdom. You could say my grandma said there's different ways of that, right? But from different societies that with new ways of measuring stuff and so on, that some of this is actually true. So we try, and, and I'm super fascinated about um, the entire spectrum, but being very aware of what are we talking about? Are we talking about double blinded studies or more an assistive wisdom that this is supposed to be good for you? Yeah. Um, yeah. Then like hypnotherapy is, so we had meditation, we've proven that with Western like science now. Hypnotherapy is another thing that we're starting to prove with more studies, something called Hello Mind, a Danish startup are doing hypnotherapy on an app. And they did a study, scientific study together with, I think, a hospital or something, where they saw that this app could uh, decrease eczema in, uh, in people. So they got wow. a big grant from the Danish government. So, uh, so we do look, we try and find the stuff that there's not too many players out there. So you can call it emergent science, mm-hmm. um, but still there's something around it. So one of the things we're building as well in Kring is something called Nuna, which is a chatbot-based app 
which is built on the basis of cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, which is the most recognized in regards to uh, working with mental health. So at CBT, not CBD. No, CBT. <laughs> Just for yeah. clarification. <laughs> yes. So cognitive behavioral therapy, which is very protocol based. So we managed to make that into like um, take some of these protocols into a chatbot and then have breathing exercises, gratitude exercises and so on. So there we take kind of old uh, science and then use technology in a new way. It's not a plan to replace humans. We want to get people out to talk with more human beings. And that's part of what Nuna actually helps someone get the confidence and, and get out there. So um, yeah, that became a longer spiel, but it's something I'm very passionate about. And that's it's so fascinating because yeah, that spectrum is really is really what, what you want hey, to learn more about. I caused you to chase that that. So, you know, I asked the question. So yeah, I want you to I want you to have time to answer that. But is that, I mean, is that fall kind of under the area of the neuroplasticity or is that, you know, a part of that? So when we talk about Nuna, um, so neuroplasticity is more about can the brain actually change or not? That we now know that the right. brain actually changes. Right. Is it a um, healing change or is it just change? That's a good question. Um, so depending on how you define a healing change or just a change, we definitely see like if you do gratitude journal and other things, um, it rewires the brain. Mm -hmm. Because if you write down a gratitude journal, um, three things you're grateful for every day or three times a week, we, we start to create the, the lines in the brain that focus more on that. So you say, um, um, uh, what is it? Neurons that uh, wire together. How is the frame? Sorry, I forgot. But there's like, the more you work on and focus on the same thing, the stronger the let, they kind of become highways up in your brain. And there's been numerous studies showing that this gratitude journal, which is just writing down three things you're grateful for, that makes people more happy over the long term. Um, the studies are showing that um, it works best if you do it three times a week instead of every single day. The reason why the studies are showing that is this process has often been done on college students over like a certain amount of weeks, and it feels stressful if they have to do it every single day. Most people start with like three times a week and then move over to doing it uh, actually every day. I write down every day or think about it before I go to bed. And that just wires the brain to be more, more positive and see the good stuff. And is there, is there, are there studies that say it's better to do it at night, better to do it in the morning? Does it matter? Does it have a different effect? So the only studies I've seen says that um, it's more about the frequency. That's, that's the importance uh, mm -hmm. more than the timing of the day. Okay. So I do it at evening time. It's also a really good thing for improving your sleep simply because if you have a stressful day, yeah. it's a way to wind down. Whether you do breathing before or some kind of meditation or gratitude journal, that's just helpful for the sleep. Mm -hmm. I often do it in the morning as well when I meditate. Then I try and think about what is it that I was grateful for the day before and what am I grateful for in general? Yeah, simply I mean, just it because so simple. It is so simple. I mean, if the best things are simple, right? Mm -hmm. But it's, it's quite simple when we think about it and intuitive that it makes sense that we have all of the bad news, right? So we know that media has around, it's a 10 bad news to every positive news, right? Yeah. So we see so much of how the world, like what's wrong in the world. So it's very intuitive that we start thinking that there's more wrong with the world, where there's so much good in the world as well. And human beings are not made to be happy. We're made to survive. So our brains are also more wired for looking for what's wrong instead of what's wrong. So we have to kind of take our human um, flaws and biases and actually do something about it. And especially as an entrepreneur. As an entrepreneur, there's like, I've hardly ever met any uh, founder who don't always have something burning, right? You might have a few months where things are not burning. But like the more success you get, the more employees you get, the more problems come, right? Yeah. So, so you need to be able to have that seeing the good side. And I think that's also what characterizes a lot of entrepreneurs that are successful. Some might be a little bit too optimistic. We see right. everything as a possibility and that's why we keep going despite of all the challenges. Yep. There's, a, there's a famous saying that says, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it is it is so true that uh i mean, so let's let's drill down a little bit in the kind of the from the business side of things i mean uh, so you know sure you can make the case that this is good this is good for you but what are the economics to to this space i mean you know it, it has to it has to have positive revenue so what what is the what's the spin pattern of, of people i mean you know, we can say, yeah, it's, it's great, but I'm not willing to spend money on it. I mean, is there, mm. is there a, is there a demand? Is there a financial demand for these services? 
So if we're talking about Nuna specifically, um, we see that uh, services like Calm and Headspace have become unicorns, meaning the valuation mm. is more than a billion dollars. Wow. And it's, it's, it's just meditation. It's yeah, basically say, just these are, yeah, this is not rocket science here. This is, this no. is brand new stuff. I mean, this is just a, it's just a, yeah, go ahead. So, so there's definitely like a possibility for, uh, for making the financial case as well. Nuna is still in its early days. We just introduced payment uh, the other day. Um, which is fairly cheap. Depends on where you look at it. There's going to be like the five to ten dollars um, a month. Mm-hmm. Um, so something that's affordable, where you kind of think about it. Do I rather rather buy a cup of coffee, or should I actually invest in my mental health? Yeah, staying on top of the game. So most of these services are super cheap, so that everyone can or most people can afford it. Right. And it's, I mean, if, especially if it's a fairly simple process or simple app or whatever, I mean, did you start with like a freemium model or did you, did you try we to onboard users and then say, okay, you can buy like in, in-app purchases type thing. So yeah. what are you purchasing? Are you purchasing different courses? Are you purchasing different music? I mean, what is it that you buy in within the app itself? Yeah. So Nuna has to, f- uh, we started the first 2000 users where it was just free, all mm-hmm. of the features. Now we still have uh, several free features, but for example, um, better access to gratitude journal and remembering some of the tools and so on, access to more tools, that's the stuff that you pay for. So anyone can kind of test it out, see is this, does this suck? Like this is really bad. <laughs> I was like, hey, this is actually pretty awesome. I like this. And then you can continue, like you want to continue using it and you pay for the premium. Like many, many services works. Like you show the the user that something actually works for them first. Right. And then if they want to continue using it, it's also fair to, well, the company has to survive somewhere, somewhere. Yep. Right. And if you're not paying, you are the product. I think mm-hmm. that's a, a pretty important thing to, to remember as well. But many services, they leave some of the stuff for free, um, but someone has to pay for it. Um, and if no one is paying, then then you are the product. And, and I think that's, that's something pretty important to be aware of as well when you choose services. So are you, are you going, trying to go head to head with like calm and headspace or is it a, is a differentiation like, like, yeah, we just kind of saw what, what was a gap in their model and we tried to fill this. I mean, was it, was it almost like a, I guess <clears throat> my question is, was it, was it almost like a reaction to what was not working well in those apps or was it just completely independent? So actually started several years ago when I was talking to an investor who wanted to wanted me to start a new company. And he was like, what would you start? And I was like, I love to talk. I'm not a big writer. Uh, so I was like, if the, when the technology is um, mature enough, so you can just ask questions like health questions, like uh, what is really true about the different vitamins, eating different things and so on, and get that knowledge a bit better. And then also the mental part. And then in kind when we were looking at building new companies, we were like, hey, it's easier to start just with technology or just with the, just with the writing. We're getting speech on Nuna quite soon mm-hmm. as well, but we started with just being able to write because it's easier to start with and just focusing on psychology and just focusing on CPT and then adding more of the different uh, approaches within psychotherapy, positive psychology, gestalt, many of the different ones. So, so in that way, we kind of started and saw like, we, we just need to have a solution out there for more people. Um, and it wasn't really looking that much at calm or headspace. It was more like, how can we help people have more conversations and, and reflect on, on their life? And often the problem is someone is just sitting at home, everything crashes. You can't get a psychology time in, in Denmark. Sometimes it takes six or eight weeks. Mm-hmm. So like, how can you get a little bit of relief on how can we also train the brain so that we again, look at the positive, not only looking at the positive, but also solve our problems. All right. So that's, that's kind of the, the approach to how we, how we thought about it. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to shift gears a little bit here. Sure. Um, you were, you're talking, you mentioned earlier in the, in the podcast about the like Nordic biohacking. So I was looking at, a, I think one of your sites earlier today, and there was something that I didn't have time to, to follow up on, but it said something like NH1 or N1 or N greater than one or whatever. What exactly is that? Yes. That's kind of the big um one of the main cornerstones of biohacking is N equals one. So that means, again, back, going back to, we look at double-blinded studies, but the wonderful thing when you look at the studies is this outliers, right? We often just remove them and say, like, it doesn't matter. Right. So you want to make sure that you try the stuff that is like double-blinded studies, try them first and see, like, is it working for you or not? So the big focus is also like the 80-20. So like, how do we get 80% of the results 
with 20% of the effort, mm -hmm. same as an entrepreneur does all the time. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways is looking at what has already been proven with studies and then see, does it work well for me? Whether it's something health-wise or like psychological studies and so on. So always look at yourself. Is it whether you can, uh, you can measure um, your weight, your endurance to be able to run, how are you feeling after sleep? Do you get a blood test that actually shows that what you're eating now, now you're getting the right vitamins and minerals or your supplements are working. So, so that's kind of like N equals one, make sure that you test it out on yourself and figure out what is working for you. Okay. All right. That, I mean, that's on your, on your website. So that if you want, if you want to learn more, the, the website is growthisland.com. Um, and it's, it's really an interesting site. I, I encourage you all to, uh, go, go spend some time just kind of perusing and, and, you know, listen to some of the podcast episodes as well that, that he's got up and, and there's even stuff on YouTube as well that, that, uh, a lot of videos there, but so is this the, is this the unicorn? Is this it? Is this the one that, that, uh, you're going to wake up five years from now and I'm going to have to call five people to get to you. So uh, Nuna is a potential unicorn. Um, Nuna should be impacting millions of people within a year or two. Uh, Growth Island should also be impacting millions of people within a year. Um, but doing workshops and some online courses and podcasts, I think is harder to get to a unicorn. Um, the ambition there is more to be able to impact millions of people and be able to live in Caparete some month, be able to give back. Um, yesterday, I was doing a workshop on Nordic biohacking here in Caparete, which was a fundraiser as well. And 90 families or 90 people, sorry, are getting fed for a week because of the contributions. Wow. Wow. So, and I think that makes you a lot more happy to be part of that than having a really big car. Yeah. That's at least yeah, no what I find. It. So, yeah. um, so that's the goal of, of being able to get to a, to a spot where I can choose more of, uh, of these projects and, and being able to spend the time where you see that direct impact of, of changing people's lives, both through what I'm doing, where I get paid but also through, uh, through doing something where I don't necessarily get paid, but I, I see the joy, right? Right. I mean, it's, it's interesting how many people that I've interviewed on this podcast that, that I would say, you know, are, are either have been very successful previously, or they're right on the brink of being very successful. And, and I don't know that I've ever had anyone that said, you know, that, that even, even implied that they were just really looking for the opportunity that I can just buy a lot more stuff. I mean, it was like, their idea of success. I mean, the, the financial part was almost secondary. It's like my idea of success is freedom and being able to give back, hmm. you know, without, without restriction or reservation. I mean, I really want to be able to spend the time on the things that I care about. And I want to, you know, have an impact, a positive impact on, on someone as a result of this. And I mean, it sounds like that's, that's, that's your personal ethos as well. I fully agree. And the same when we do the workshops, we also talk about what makes a happy life. It does not make a happy life to sit on a pile of money. Yeah. It makes a happy life to have freedom, to spend it, to be healthy and be able to contribute to others. Right. Right. So tell me, look back over the last five or 10 years of, you know, different things that you've been involved in. What are some things that, that, you know, you've some really hard lessons that you think you've learned as a result of, I mean, being entrepreneurial life is not an easy road. No, I mean, it, it's not for cowards. I mean, it's, it is, it's, it's not for the, the faint of heart, you know? So what are some, some like hard knocks that you've, you've had that you say, man, I wish I wouldn't had to go through that. So I wish I was better at taking time off. That's definitely a lesson. Mm. When I was doing my, um, my surf startup, which was where we got um, external funding and we had like users in 30 countries and people working at different continents and so on and managing that. I was working every day from like nine till 11, one in the night, wow. um, seven days a week for like two years. And I loved it. Uh, I had a fantastic co-founder and we felt like we were on a mission to change the world. We were going to empower micro entrepreneurs in developing countries and be able to make a more sustainable world. So we really felt like we were on a mission to do something great. But uh, working that much doesn't leave the same space to reflect. Yeah. And had I taken more time off instead of just be like working, executing, executing, I would definitely have made some better decisions along the way. Um, so I really think as a business owner, and it's that hard balance, right? It's getting time where you're not executing because you're still thinking about your business mm -hmm. or, or you might be good enough to take right. the time off, 
but it's getting getting that space to reflect better. So when we have entrepreneurs joining our companies in Kang, I, I always tell them that of course we expect you to like put in hours, but try and take weekends off, or at mm-hmm. least one day off in the weekend to make sure you clear your head as well, yeah. because you will be making better decisions. And I wish I had been better at that. And the other thing was I was traveling around the world to these beautiful locations, and again there I was working all the time. Yeah, I could have taken a few more hours off to <laughs> surf. It would not have changed anything. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I, it's interesting. You, I, I, I did a surf startup and I worked so hard. I didn't have time to surf. Yes. <laughs> it's, you're, isn't that kind of defeating the purpose of what you were trying to, to accomplish here? But yeah, I, that is, that is so very true. So very true. And, and um, I mean, just looking back, I mean, not only is it, is it, uh, are you kind of missing as life is going by, but I mean, it's, it can't be healthy for you either. No. So I felt a lot higher energy when I was working on something I felt that passionate about. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't feeling tired in the, in the evenings. So we know that um, cortisol can be good for you. It could create good stress, but a high amount of long-term cortisol is where you get like sickness and illness. Yeah. So it's, it's also very much like there's a limit <laughs> and you definitely right. need to take more breaks. Yeah. And then there's also, I do believe that it, it does change whether like how passionate are you about what you're working on. And that's not to say that you should work all weekends Mm -hmm. because like the study is showing that around 60 hours, if you work more than 60 hours, you don't get additional output. Yeah. That much depends on what task you're doing. If you're doing creative work, we know most people, it might be like 30 hours or 40 hours that you can actually put in and then it's going to be dismissing because you don't have the same creativity and so on. Right. But yeah, and if you're France, it's 35 hours for everybody. I mean, yeah. <laughs> we, we, we don't work past 35 hours. So, no. Uh, so what? Give me a give me a typical day in the life of a mass priest. I would love to say I have a typical day, but that doesn't really exist. <laughs> uh, what That's is the life typical, of an entrepreneur? It, what is typical is I try to get to bed in decent time. Uh, Not always easy, but around 10 o'clock, I really value my sleep. I think that's going back to like working. Yeah. Getting sleep for me is a, is a non-negotiable. So I always make sure I get my seven to eight hours of sleep um, and then I can work. But then I start up in the morning, I meditate um, and then I get started on my day. I try to have Thursdays and Fridays. I want to do a podcast and the other days are when I'm normally more executing on learning new things and producing. Mm-hmm. Um, I make sure that kind of like my morning is uh, until nine o'clock at least as much as possible free to kind of do some movement or just like ease into the day before I, before the day starts full on. So do you have like like other productivity tips that you I mean like how to manage work well don't don't multitask don't check email before 11 a.m. You know, I mean, what are some things that you've built intentionally built in? You know, do you schedule, do you block your schedule? Do you, you know, do you batch work? I mean, what are some of the things that you, that you do? Many of the things you're mentioning. So uh, I just read your bio. I just, I (laughs) stole all those. So yeah, that's right. (laughs) But uh, I schedule quite religiously my calendar. I don't always follow it, follow it, but that I know like what I set out to do for the week. Mm -hmm. But then I look at, can I actually get it done? I think it's a typical mistake that many people do. They schedule too many things or like they plan to do too many things, but if they put it into a calendar, they would see it would be impossible. Mm -hmm. And then they end up suddenly not having prioritized the most important things. So I do that normally Sunday or Friday that I kind of prioritize and then I do again Monday that something else come in. So I make sure that the things that are most important are the ones that are getting the attention. Mm-hmm. Um, I do the same thing as like, I don't, I put my phone on flight mode when I go to bed and I don't turn off before I meditate so that I'm fully ready just to take it on. When I was a management consultant, I used to wake up as the first thing and I look at my phone. Yep. That's not the way to, yep. uh, to get the brain and everything started um, and not the best way to solve challenges. And that's also why many people are burning out. Right. So you can work a high load if you prioritize and take care of yourself as well. Sleep, exercise, food and so on. But going back to, again, productivity tips, um, I have something called iris on my computer, which changes the light spectrum. So it's not as hard for the eyes and which is really good for the evening, meaning you get better sleep. And then also has that it comes down with a break after 25 minutes. The Pomodoro technique, what, yeah. 25 minutes? I love those, the tomato timer. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Just I do a little stretching. I don't always do five minutes, but mm-hmm. I I do something. And sometimes I also just like click it away. But I try to take it. 
I make sure I try to schedule that I have um, until 11 or 12. I don't have meetings mm -hmm. because those are the more um, productive hours for me to focus on yes. stuff. Yeah. And then later in the day, I try to have more of the meetings. I mm -hmm. think that's really like managing your energy and not only managing your time that that focusing on what activities makes sense. And that's sometimes hard for the team. I don't check my email all the time, the whole notification thing. We know that um, London uh, University, there was a study showing that you lose 10 IQ points if you are multitasking. Someone that smokes weed loses four. So uh, the person sitting and, and multitasking is less effective and thinking they're so busy and so productive, uh, much less effective than uh, the homie sitting next next door, uh, smoking some weed and uh, focusing on one task. It's the same as not sleeping 36 hours as well. That is like, so one multitasker equals two and a half people smoking weed. <laughs> that is... Uh... I'm, I'm, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I can, I can vouch for the multitasking side of things. I, I, um, yeah, I certainly, it's amazing that you just kind of get lost. And it's like the old saying that says, you know, you are, you are a master of none, you know, mm -hmm. you're not, you're a master of anything you haven't, you're, you have a jack of all trades, but you're a master of none. So yeah. you're not doing anything well. You're just trying to kind of muddle through, but um, I, I mean, I love the idea of, of just, thinking i mean i was thinking about kind of the blue light you know issue like right before you go to bed and actually i was going to ask you about that and you mentioned it you know just a, a second ago and uh, do you i mean do you kind of shut try to shut down screens an hour before you go to bed do you uh i mean it's probably an in intention but it doesn't happen all the time um i would love to say that i do but i don't <laughs> it would def so i think it's it's that spectrum of what's optimal yeah and also like how do you live your life with the different demands that are coming on you right yeah um, ideally, I would shut down all of my screens at uh, at eight o'clock. I try, especially when I'm back in Denmark, I try to put my phone on flight mode around nine or nine thirty, mm -hmm. and then go to bed around an hour after. But yeah. I often still sit and uh, and finish up some stuff on uh, on my computer. But I do have that change of light, and my light bulbs at home are also more the red spectrum, mm -hmm. meaning that um, it induces a better sleep. So we we so do know from many studies. I try to be very intentional. Yeah, Some you, people I mean, it's not, a, it's not just like accidentally walking through life. I mean, there, there's a real intent behind, behind things. So, which, I mean, I would guess that, you know, you even maybe take a, take a minimalist approach to furniture. You use a standing desk. Um, I mean, what are some other things that you may, that you may, I mean, even your, I would think even your wardrobe, probably you try to keep it pretty simple. So you don't have to even, did, even think did you that. talk to my girlfriend before? No. Or? <laughs> just, Hey, just thinking through the profile. <laughs> yeah. Right. But uh, very true. I have many black t-shirts. Exactly. Uh, it's your white t-shirts. Steve Jobs influence there, I think. or something. I, like I don't have the turtle legs, but um, <laughs> that's right. I, um, I try to keep my life very simple. Uh, yeah. I tried once if I could have only a hundred things. I found out that didn't work that well with having socks and underwear. That's something yeah. you wouldn't have much else. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I have standing desk. Um, I make sure that I have a yoga mat as well so I can do different things. Um, I wake up and I have often lemon and salt, um, lion's mane, which is like mm -hmm. mushroom tea. Yeah. Uh, I don't drink coffee. I should potentially get started on it, but I don't like addictions. So and a lot see a lot of people being addicted, but the studies in general are showing that coffee can be really good. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't drink your coffee. Um, so so yeah, life is try to be simplified as as much as possible. Um, I, I think that creates a, an easier life that I don't have too much ruminating. Yeah. Um, and I use my phone to write down in notes the things that I have to do, checklist and so on, mm -hmm. without letting the checklist uh, run my life or rule my life. I think right. it really helps for uh, for productive space. So I've got I've got a couple of quick questions here that I kind of want to close with. Um, one is um, from a productivity standpoint, like you know, I've heard I've heard studies that talk about if you have more than three to do items, then you pro or if you or you have three priorities in the day, then you don't have anything that's a priority. So how do you how do you incorporate that? Is that I mean, do you kind of live by that that same mantra? Um, no. So when, when I was working full time with the ventures, um, there would always be more like if you're running four ventures, it's hard only to have three priorities. Yeah. I think a lot of this stuff yeah. makes a lot of things in theory, mm -hmm. but it doesn't always like relate to practical. 
uh, I do believe there's something about that I focus on a few things that are the most important and then mm-hmm. I have all these smaller to-dos, right? Right. Um, and whether there's always three or whether there's only one, I definitely try to have like, this is the main thing. These are all the small tasks that have to be mm-hmm. done. And then I try to do like the main thing in the morning. Yeah. Um, or if there's something that's like, this is just something that's really important to get got done today. It's going to take me five minutes. I do them quickly but I want to use my energy when it's best on the tasks mm-hmm. that are most important. But we also know like such a small thing that if you have a to-do list, if you have things that you've already done, you get more momentum to do in the nest. So sometimes having the things that you had to do the day before, having them on because you look like you're more done. Yeah. And the same thing when you're selling, we know would like uh, get a 10th coffee for free that one of them is already pinched in. Several studies have shown that people will be more likely to come in. So I try to use those small cognitive biases to uh, to help myself have something that I already accomplished, so that I feel like I'm a, I'm having some momentum. It is, I mean, it's like cognitive momentum. I mean, it's like uh, it's it's like you you've persuaded your brain that you're actually in motion, you know. And I mean, there's a scientific principle that said a body in motion is you know will stay in motion until it's stopped. But and it's easier to get something moving that is already you know in in that process. So, I'm really curious about your approach to social media. So I, I'm, you know, it's easy to, for me to sit back and try to, you know, guess your your whole life spectrum, you know, just based on our our Zoom chat here. But I would venture You've to guess. You've been doing that, well so far. <laughs> so about eight out of ten. That's right. I would guess you are pretty selective, even on how you use social media. That you you don't just, you know, Facebook certain or you know, Instagram, just constant scrolling or whatever. It doesn't rule your life, but you use it in ways that you think are beneficial to the things you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. So I think it's, it's extremely important. And I talk about that in some of my workshops as well, intentional social media. Mm-hmm. Social media can either be ruling you or you can use it as a really good thing to connect and get inspiration. Who are you following? Are you following people you get inspiration from? Yeah. Are you just going to go in there constantly or could you actually be breathing instead? On iPhone, you can set a limitation on how much you're on social media. So 10 minutes, for example, I put that on uh, several of Instagram and so on. Um, so I really try to use it um, intentionally. I use it very much for business purpose. Uh, yeah, it is, I would think that. It's one of my big channels that people see. Um, mm-hmm. To be honest, I would probably prefer not having to use it. It's one of the mm-hmm. things that I often discuss with it's friends. Like a necessary that evil, yeah. Yeah, um, because I use it more than I would want to, but I, it's a way to share and also get more stuff out about the podcast. But otherwise, I try to be like three to four times a day that I check in. Um, not always that that hits, but um, I try only having a few check-ins and then engage with people that I appreciate. Uh, so they also show up in my feed. And using that intentional way. And I found Instagram is very easy to see stories and just send like um, some kind of emoji. And mm-hmm. we all like to be seen. I like yep. to be seen as well, yep. like when my friend sends it. So, uh, so yeah, I think a lot about that. It is. Uh, it's interesting. On my phone, I found myself just continually looking at Facebook or looking at Instagram or looking at, and I, and I literally just took the apps off my phone. And, and I, I only have like LinkedIn and I still have Twitter, but they are both for are really directed business purposes. I mean, it's not like I'm just on there just, you know, chatting and scrolling. So um, I, I do think that it, it, I love the word you used intentional, you know, how can you use this intentional and proactively instead of just reactively. And, and uh, I mean, it's the, all the neurons firing off in your brain. I mean, when you're, when you're listening, you know, watching things, you can, you know, you, you get, somebody says something snarky, you know, and you're like, I have, they'll ruin the rest of my day, you know, just think something I might've read on social media. But as we wrap up today, I just, uh, we covered so many things, but is there something that I have not asked you about that, that you would like to just kind of close out our chat today and, you know, something, just leave a kind of a golden nugget with our, with our listeners here as we close and then, then tell people where the best place, just remind them again, the best place to find you online. Sure. So I think the basics are actually the most important. Like I love going deep with like technology and like the cutting edge stuff, um, which is part of the podcast, but like don't beat yourself too much up, especially as an entrepreneur, Mm. like there's enough challenges out there. Uh, remember to breathe instead of going to social media all the time. Yeah. So, so I think those are just like, don't beat yourself up too much. Um, and then remember to do some deep breathing and other stuff that kind of calms you down and that you're focused. And the best place to find you online? Growthisland.com, which is my website, or on Instagram, which is Mass M Fries. So Mass M A D S M 
F R I I S. That is where I uh, try to be more active <clears throat> and uh, and share more about uh, the journey that I'm on. Well, we will make sure that those are in the show notes as when the episode is released. And remind me of the of the app again. Yeah, that is Nuna. Dot AI. N U N A. Dot okay. AI. And is that is that released or is that it in is, process? It is released. released. Okay. So yeah, we already we had two thousand users early early yeah. on. So. All right. Well, Mass, thank you so much for just taking the time to chat today. And I really appreciate it. I, I am I'm highly impressed with the content you produce and, and uh, just the way that you conduct your podcast. And you have done a great job with, with a multitude of guests. And there's some really good stuff on your site there. So keep up that great work. And but just thank you for taking time and just really helping all boats rise in a rising tide. Mass, have a great weekend. Thanks. And thank you so much for bringing me on, Kevin. Another episode in the books. We hope you heard some great takeaways. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a five-star review on iTunes and YouTube. As always, thanks for listening to Rising Tide.